Hey everybody, so uh, today I will be recording the third video, as you can see, in the ABCs of networking, networking introduction. Alright, so um, I'm going to talk today a little bit about the hub versus the switch. The approach I want to take from here is that I want to start from the early days and see how they evolved and see how those technologies, even today, is still relevant. All right, so I'll talk a couple of about a couple of concepts today. Yep. So, well, how relevant is a hub? Well, I think, like I said before, you know, this is not exam questions. This is not to help you sell more devices or anything like that. What this is all about is to understand the logic. And if you understand the logic, all right, want to know the logic of networking, you need you need to understand the building blocks of networking, how they evolved, you know, through time, how they ended up with a device called a switch, how switching today is really relevant because a lot of data centers are looking at how they can change the data centers very relevant data centers into layer two switches uh, at layer two switch data centers versus layer three right so it is important to see um, what the hub did initially and how the switch evolved the hub infrastructure right and to understand why they did those certain things right so from that point of view um, what i would like to do of course is move to the next slide just as you can see quite exciting i'm trying to use a new background okay but effectively like i said the hub versus the switch but before we get there perhaps we can just step back a little bit okay like i said 1967 you had these two devices all right two devices they wanted to co computers they wanted to connect together and they actually of course connected them in those days i'm pretty sure it was you know i know it was huge devices but they had control over this entire infrastructure all right that's important because they pretty much owned everything there all right and of course they did a lot of things they got things right and they actually got stuff working and so forth but over time what happened was they must have seen the potential of this uh, technology and somebody along the line might have sat there and said what if we did this add a third device to this right uh, as we know all right in those days it was still controlled by the same unit of course most probably but more importantly was that as soon as you added a third device all right a lot of rules changed because point-to-point -point communication versus point to multipoint and that you'll see a lot point to or sometimes referred to as point to point or point to multipoint okay this is really really important the difference between the two because protocols were built specifically around point to point or versus point to multipoint or differentiation between them was really important in things like OSPF how it elects of course a root uh, and so forth and how it elects different devices inside OSPF so even then by just adding one device to this you have moved from a significantly significantly important point to point type network where we actually had unicast type traffic into a point to multi-point environment now immediately what happened there was how do we do this okay because we knew in those days at least they were using copper right copper and what we saw of course was at that stage that we actually had a, a specific co coaxial type cable right so just to quickly explain a coaxial type cable a coaxial type cable from the outside would actually have a shielding yeah uh, not shielding but basically a piece of plastic near yeah, that keeps everything together inside that piece of plastic it would basically have a copper mesh to get rid of noise from the outside because what if you actually put two cables together right and you actually ran electricity through it you know that today if you actually have electricity running between the two you could actually have cross interference and what we know about electricity is in this case we're either sending a one or a zero which is a plus or a minus inf effectively and it would look something like this you know on a chart right and this being the zero and this of course be would be a one and this would be a zero and a zero and over distance of course this would attenuate it will actually die the signal but if we actually put two together what would happen is they would start to cross influence each other right two copper cables like this so what they would do is put shielding in between right to stop this interference at this point there then of course they had very importantly they actually had another segment in here right which was a pvc a heavy pvc type shielding right inside there and then of course right in the middle the most important thing was the actual core and that was the money okay so they actually had a cable like that running from this point to the other point right and those are the rj58 cables we spoke about a lot if you want to know what that looks like if you go to your tvs today 
the television sets. This is typically still the same features that they use in there, the same type of cabling. Slightly different, but same type of concept there. Right, so very well known. And of course, now what they had is they had a way to connect this directly onto the network interface card and another network interface card. They had connectors for that. But as soon as you introduced an environment like this, what you had to do was find a way to do that. Two things became quite apparent in the old days. All right, it was, well, the bigger this core, the more data you can send through. Yeah, the better it gets. But also, the bigger this core, they used to talk about the frozen host pipe installation because this was like a frozen host pipe, you know, this thick cable. And they started coming up with two concepts there. They had something called a thick net cable and a thin net cable. Right. So why they had two different types of cable is the thick net cable was really cool in the fact that it could get up to 500 meters of distance. The thin net was much lower, but the thing is with thick net, thick net to the PC was really difficult to work with. Uh, and I mean really difficult to work with. So what they would do is they would basically well, combine the two in the old days and come up with a thick net slash thin net combination. Now they had different types of connectors to do all of this. Right, and they had something like a vampire tap. Vampire tap. It was actually a device that you would slot over here. All right, and inside this device, it actually had two pins a pin that would go into the core, and another pin that would go into the mesh. All right, to take out the noise. And effectively, what they did with that was literally they tapped into the actual core, into the actual device itself, into the copper. Uh, a lot of guys got spiked by it, right? drew some blood, and that's why they knew it as a vampire tap, because it created two holes. Uh, but more importantly, it also created holes in thumbs. Uh, so the guys didn't like this equipment at all. However, that was the only way, because you could not strip the cable down every single time to connect something new on. So it was groundbreaking in the days, right? Taking the day into consideration how easily we connect onto networks, this was pretty damn hard right to do anyway that was the thick net and what they would do is they would basically then from there draw cables out right typically something like a, a connector you know that would pull out they also had bnc connectors right so they came up with the bnc standards bnc sorry for the old history but that's quite interesting right because from a bnc point of view what you would do is it would actually have t connectors right so you'd have a connector and pretty much uh, connect a cable onto there and a cable onto here and another cable onto there all right and what you could do is you could take a piece of cable literally strip it cut it down put a T connector in here all right and you could actually add another device to the network but it was literally cutting the cable now what's important about this is that you need to understand is as soon as you cut that cable right you basically had signal bounds your electricity would bounce back. So as the electricity comes firing down there, remember we spoke about that, it would fire right back again until it's basically earthed. Right, and what you could not do while you were setting all of this up, if you wanted to add a device to your network, you actually had to do it after hours out of production because once you cut that cable, you've got signal bounds and the whole network would die. Right, could not work. So effectively, once you cut that cable, you had to work really fast to get this T. So that's once again why the vampire tap was so cool. So all of these were quite restrictive, but quite groundbreaking in the days, especially into ThickNet. Now what they realized, of course, over time was, well, this could not keep on happening as this network started to grow, you know, as devices started adding up, all right? In the beginning, you know, to add a third device to two is not that bad, you could control over two. But as you started growing the network, it just was not relevant anymore, it just couldn't work anymore. So let's move into the step. So we, right at this point, enters the, hub okay a device now what they did with this device is they said well what if we did this what's one of the issues what you had is well if you cut the cable you have signal bounds yeah so what if we could create a device inside the device extend the copper right terminate the copper so this thing actually had an earth right earth that went to earth that could kill electricity and what they did is they basically created connectors over here BNC connectors 
And if you wanted to add a device to this, you put a device here, a computer, and you connect it. And as soon as you connect it, right, what happens is traffic will start to flow into this network. Brilliant. What's also nice about this is effectively what you could do is if nothing was connected over here, all right, it would all be terminated. So I could set everything up and as soon as I connect this device to this, I suddenly had copper flowing or basically uh, electricity flowing over this cable. That was pretty cool, right? Because I could literally just take another device, a computer, and just literally connect it under there as well and without influencing this initially. All right, I could add devices to this network. And that was pretty cool. Once again, I could just keep on adding. And once again, if you basically take it off, you disconnect it, it had no influence because they would terminate the signal. And that was pretty cool, right. Uh, and that's so, in the beginning, the hub was really an awesome device. However, what do we know about networks? Uh, well, as soon as we start doing things and they start working well, what do we do with them? Well, we break them. We abuse them to the point of breakage. Yeah. But this is how a network in the older days looked like. They had, let's say, remember, thick net and they had thin net. Yeah? So the frozen host, they wanted to get 500 meters. They would pretty much connect a backbone here. And with termination, termination here. Yeah? And they would use vampire taps, tap out of this and put a hub down. And then a whole bunch of PCs. Right, just to make it clear that this red cable here was the thick net, and I want to almost make this the thin net here, with BNC connectors. Okay, so once again, they would draw out from a certain point, and next floor, they would basically put a hub in place, hub with the net and devices and of course next floor and then so I that was wrong yeah let's just fix that quickly so let's do it this way that's remember the vampire tap goes into a hub with connections into the floor and last but not least right they would actually have something connecting to a hub and there would be your servers basement they typically put them in the basement, the servers, so that people could start accessing the servers through this infrastructure. Now, this was all really cool, but there was one challenge with this. Okay, so at some point, what we started finding was, if you think about logically, how does this network look like? Well, effectively, it starts with a thick net cable, all right, that extends into, with the net, extends into a hub which is another piece of copper all right and with a bunch of pcs connected to it and every time you do this you have a bunch of pcs so what i want to say is logically if you think about this what it looks like is it's literally a single piece of copper because if you take the copper from there to there it's just an extension of copper every single time so you end up with a piece of copper running from there to there with a whole lot of devices on here. Logically, this is what it looked like. It was a very flat network, right? Forget about VLANs and everything else like that. And we had a concept of if this guy sends traffic and this guy sends traffic at the same time, what would happen is it would collide in the middle somewhere, right? Or collisions. So as they extended this network and life started getting much better for the installers, effectively they started running into a bit of a challenge of congestion. They started getting a lot of collisions on these cables, right? Because everything was just sending in. There was no logic to it. There was no ways of controlling what traffic goes first and last, whatever the case may be. And this is where I want to step back to the OSI model. Right, we'll talk about that very quickly just again. So in the Aussie model, remember the physical there's no logic in here, layer, right? So that's exactly where the hub lives, is in the logical layer, oh, sorry, in the physical layer, because there's no logic to it. What the hub did, it was, it was nothing but a device that received electricity and just distributed it everywhere. Just boom, goes everywhere, right? So um, there was no logic to it. 
there was no decisions being made. And that's when you look at the data link layer. Uh, data link layer, they had to come up with a way to segment traffic on the network, or at least cut down on certain types of traffic on the network. So I want to step into the next slide, into the types of communication you do get today. All right, so let's change color there. You get different types of communication. You get unicast traffic, okay? And we'll talk about them all. You get broadcast traffic, right? And then I'm just gonna mention multicast traffic for now. But these two are loosely, I wanna say, almost coupled together. It's one to many, where this is one to one. Point to point, point to multipoint. Like I said to you, there's some certain rules there. So what you have is, if you actually have a couple of devices, PC one, PC two, PC three, and they all connected to the same cable. For now, logically, that's a hub. PC one wants to talk to PC three. Okay, PC one wants to talk to, let's say PC three there. Oh no, let's make it interesting. Let's just make it real. Okay, let's call it server. Okay, any one of these want to talk to server because remember that was a northbound type traffic, north south type bound type traffic. So PC one, all these devices want to talk to a server. Yeah, that was a big, very big powerful machine. When one wanted to talk to the server, what happened to the traffic was the traffic hits the copper and goes that side's terminated, it's cool. All right, let's change color, it'll make more sense. Okay, so let's make it unicast traffic. Unicast traffic goes there and terminates. Goes across, I know, give me one second. Okay, hits the server, which is great traffic. Love it, that's what it's supposed to do. It's talking to the server. But at the same time, it also hit two and three. Okay, this is a lot of wasted bandwidth that we have there. And a lot of wasted cycles, right? Because these guys had to drop the packets at some point. So this doesn't make a lot of sense because at the same time, two wanted to look to three, right? So it would also send traffic out at the same time, right? This traffic would go across, you got it, and you got it. And three would do the same thing. T gets it, and one gets it, and server gets it. <coughs> so the, they must have come up, they, they, they had to come up with a new way of doing this. Right, but the truth is sometimes you need this type of traffic, you know, like broadcast traffic, like for instance, when you do an op, when you do not know addressing of something else, you want some traffic to be broadcast traffic. Right, so broadcast traffic, you always wanted to go everywhere. So you couldn't just segment it totally, all right? Um, you couldn't create an environment where you actually had, okay, server showing over here, PC1, PC1, uh, PC2, and PC3, because this is one of the options they could have had. They said, well, always there'll be a cable for every single one. But there was also a case where three had to talk to two sometimes with applications. Okay, so that could never work. So they had to have a shared infrastructure as well, somewhere along the line, because of broadcast traffic. So the difference between unicast traffic is when I say, hey, Joe, you living in whatever, you, uh, and we're having a conversation. If, as soon as we're having a conversation with one to one, everybody else is not supposed to be listening. If they are listening, it's not relevant to them, all right? But anyway, so broadcast traffic is effectively, hey, I want all of you to listen to me right now because I'm going to say something really important about your exam. And everybody listens. Okay, so I want to address a big audience. However, when I talk to a big audience, right, I expect everybody to get value out of that, that conversation. Right, so the multicast traffic is when I say to you, okay, if you drive a red car, I want you to listen because the effect of sun on your red car is really uh, damaging. And if you just use... Oh, you get what I'm saying? Uh, that's multicast. Multicast, I'm still talking to an audience, but an audience with a very specific need or requirement. You broadcast traffic is literally everybody because somewhere along the line, everybody needs to know about what I'm doing, right? And unicast traffic is effectively talking to a single individual or single device. Good. Right, so that's the difference between the types of traffic there. So very important for us is that all of these are important. As we know, multicast traffic today is really relevant in a lot of types of environments. We'll talk about that later on in this course. We'll talk about this. Broadcast traffic is some way to resolve addressing initially, and there's other broadcast uh, type of traffic as well. And unicast traffic is once I've identified a device, through broadcast traffic, I then find a way to unicast them. But in a flat network like this, unicast, broadcast, multicast has no concept. Okay, because it's just an extension of copier. So somewhere along the line, we needed to put off, we need to put a device in place here, 
all right, that really understands the difference between unicast, broadcast, and multicast traffic. And we cannot do that at a physical layer, because at a physical layer, there's no logic. There's no understanding of this. So then we move up the layer, and we move into the data link layer. And over here, things become relevant. Things like MAC addressing. Things like uh, layer two technologies like Ethernet. Ethernet, all right? Things like uh, uh, addressing logical link control and so forth. And so from this point of view, this layer here introduced something called logic. Ooh, that's interesting. Okay. Um, so anyway, let's just fix that. Okay. Logic. And as soon as you have logic, you need some type of CPU, some type of ASIC, something to figure out the logic. And hubs had none of that. And there enters the actual switch. So let's talk a little bit about switching. So what switching does is, I'm gonna build the switch right in the middle of this. Let's change that to a white, okay, let's see. There's a switch over here, a couple of things. Remember this switch has logic. Okay, so a couple of things the switch will know is should be able to look into the packet. It should be able to see inside the packet. So I'm gonna quickly show you the, the workings of the switch. So we have a PC, one, a PC, two, a PC, three, and let's say, server so for the first time ever what we see now is that the switch is just not a piece of it's got a backplane make no mistake but it also has logic it can direct packets across this network so basically it sits with a logic inside here a decision can be made okay so effectively i want to almost say that every single cable is connected to this logical segment okay some way that can make a decision it's not just a piece of copper in the backlink okay make no mistake some type of logic is used so remember we had unicast type traffic unicast let's call it that all right and if we look at the previous slide we had i want to use the same colors it's easier okay unicast was blue okay so and green was okay brilliant let's go forward Let's wipe that quickly. Okay. So we've got unicast traffic and we've got broadcast traffic. For now, I'm not going to talk about multicasting too much. That comes in a later game. Okay, we'll talk about that. Okay, so what they had to bring in play was think about this. Well, let's say the traffic is from PC1. Um, let's change the color. Let's say from PC1. We want to talk to server. So how do we stop traffic from flowing to two and three? Well, the only way if we have logic is we have to come up with some type of addressing scheme, some way of name. Hey, Bob, I want you to listen to me. Okay, um, so that's pretty cool. Okay, so let's come up with some type of addressing scheme. Let's call this is A, B, C, and D. So we've now added logic to the network, okay, some way of addressing. So what I'm going to say is if one wants to talk to server, it means that I want to have A talking to D. I know what you're all thinking, A, oh, uh, uh, broadcast, I know. Okay, give me one second. Okay, so I'm looking at the end goal in mind. So I want traffic flowing from A to D not to go to B and C. So as the traffic comes in, hits the logic, there's some way for the switch to look at the packet. So if you start to construct the packet here, right, it's got to have a source address and a destination address. But the most important thing right now is the destination address. So as a packet coming from A, it's going to D. I know what you're thinking. Give me a couple of seconds. Okay, as it comes in, it hits the logic of the switch. The switch makes a decision and says, wait a moment, okay, not there and not there. So how does a switch make that decision? 
Well, let's step one step forward and say, okay, well, in this case, what do we have? Well, we've got port one, port two, port three, and port four. Brilliant. So the switch starts to build a table, a MAC address table. Logic. It says I've got ports one, two, three, and four. Hey, that's pretty cool. Okay, and for now, please, once again, stick with me. Stick with me. Don't get upset yet. Okay, we now know, if I look at this picture, that this is A, and this is B, yeah, and this is C, and this is D. Stick with me. Don't get upset with me yet. Okay, so packet fires out. Okay, there it comes. It's a blue packet. It's a unicast packet. Hits there. It's this packet over here. The switch looks at its table and says detonation is D. D equals 4 and fires the packet out of 4 and the server gets it. These guys never get it. That's pretty cool. Okay, so I know what you're thinking. So the guys must have sat there and said, okay, so now we have A, B, C, and D. Brilliant, which means how do we assign those addresses? Well, in the beginning, it was a network interface card, a NIC, and they had ASICs running on there. Right, and not everybody could actually really program these ASICs, so the NIC would come with a MAC address on it. And that MAC address was A, let's say, or B, or C. And there's components to the MAC address. It was vendor-specific versus a unique number. So all the vendor-specific would, let's say, maker A got A1, A2, A3. And they would sell A1, A2, A3, and a couple of these up to a point. And at some point, what happens is that company A wants to buy some more, and then they get A22. Well, how do you get all of this data into your switch, into your Mac table? And this must have been their next session. Remember, if they control all of this, they had four devices. They could put whatever Mac addresses they wanted to be uh, uh, available to them. Uh, and that's really cool. But then they look at the logistics side of it and said, wait a moment, in real life, we're going to sell these things or people will buy them. How do we predict a hardware-based numbering plan? That's tough. Okay, so there's got to be a different way of doing this. Okay, and now enters the protocol called ARP. So let's quickly talk a little bit about ARP. Address Resolution Protocol. Address, layer 2 address, re resolution, resolve protocol. Okay, so since I do not always know, I cannot predict always the MAC address and pre-build it. You could do that today with static MACs, but you can't always pre-build your MAC address table. Effectively, what they said was with switch every single time, you had to program the... Can, can you imagine? Every single time you had to put in the CLI. What is a MAC address? And it moves. They had to come up with a better way of doing that. So what they decided to do was, they said, well, what if we do the following? What if we start with an actual switch uh, address, uh, uh, sorry, MAC address table that's empty initially? And it doesn't matter. This is not permanent because what you would find is that devices could move around. Yeah, you get sticky and oh no, let's talk about that later. But they started with an empty MAC address table on the switch. Okay, so there's your switch setting over here. All right, and I'm going to put logic in here logic right and i say that there is a potential port and a potential port and a potential port and a potential port right and that was connected to logic 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 and logic memory cpu something figuring things out okay and this initial mac address table was empty and let's say i'm going to use um colors here so let's say i am vendor a right and in this case i'm going to say i'm vendor a and this is mac address or one and you decide to buy something from another vendor so vendor b mac address or one and you could go back to vendor a and in this case we've got vendor a mac address it can never be the same they decided that mac addresses will be unique across the world that's why you have a vendor portion to it I know it looks different in real life. Don't worry about that. That's hexadecimal. We'll get back to that. Okay, so you've got A1, right? So this can't be A1 again. 
Because if you had another A1, what would happen to a MAC address table? You had A1 in two different ports. That couldn't work. So they realized very early on, wait a moment, this is going to be unique across the world because this is hard coded. And this A1 could be sold to any person in the world. Right? They couldn't predict where it would end up. So what they had to do was they had to make very sure that the A1 was never replicated. So they gave vendors a very specific vendor code. So the vendor code, because otherwise, how would you predict numbers? How can this one vendor tell the other vendor, oh, I'm going to use numbers 1 to 100, yeah? And he runs out of 100, what does he do? 100 to 1, but another vendor owns it. So what they did is they split the actual MAC address into two. So a MAC address is, let's say, A, 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 uh, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, hexadecimal. Right. There's a vendor portion and there's a unique number. So there's a lot of potential for every single vendor. So what they said is this will always be the same for every single vendor and this will be always unique inside. So if somebody replicated this number with a different vendor, you see what I'm getting at? It's different numbers. So this had to be something like a two. It can never be a one again. Okay, next step up. Let's say there's, this is vendor C. I'm just going to get really interesting here. Uh, vendor C, one. Okay, so this could be anything. And if you have a switch, you could not, you have to pre-program the switch or you have to find a protocol that could resolve this for you. Well, that's where ARP comes into play. Right, so what you did was, if you actually send out the first packet and we said, well, we want to talk from A1, let's say this is, um, let's just give them names here. Okay, PC1, 2, 3, server. So at this point, I want to talk from one to server. Okay, so I have a source port and I have a destination port. So what op happens is this packet will be marked as an op packet. Hey, I am op, by the way. Right, and the first thing they came up with, they said, well, what if I want everybody, because remember these devices will only look at its own MAC address. So the device would look at its own MAC address. So point to point but it would also look at a broadcast address. And they decided to make this in uh, uh, hexadecimal terms, 12 Fs. Right, so an F, 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 dash, 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 dash. Okay, so 12 Fs would be a broadcast address. So my source port would be A1, vendor A, number one going to 12 f's broadcast and this packet would be marked as an op packet right boom packet hits as the packet fires out hits the switch right the logic side of it the logic says okay where am i supposed to send this ah it's supposed to go everywhere that's broadcast traffic and he fires the packet out there there and there simply because he doesn't know what the destination port is. Right, right now. I'm talking about op. I'm not talking about unknown unicast here. Yeah? Give me one second. Okay, so he looks at this table and says, uh, okay, I've got to send it everywhere. But before I send the packet out, I first have to learn something. Okay, um, if the packet is, that's great. I can send it out, but I've learned something. Okay, I've also learned that this is port one. Let's just make a proper one. One, two, three, four. He's learned that on one equals MAC address A1. Okay. And this packet pretty much fires out to absolutely everyone. Now, op is addressing, uh, resolving a layer two address to a layer three address. Okay. So that's one side of broadcast traffic that's really important. On the other side, though, is if we didn't use layer 3 addressing for now, let's say it's only a layer 2 network and I'll, I wanted to figure out, right? There's another way that we could send. Well, let's say, because remember, somewhere along the line, the server wants to talk to another server. Oh, the, the device wants to talk to a server. So it was really difficult to know the MAC addressing. And this is where you'll see later on, I'm going to step into layer 3 addressing. That's why we needed layer 3 addressing. And we couldn't just use layer 2 addressing. Okay, but more importantly is, even if I knew his logical address, Right, which means somehow I already knew his MAC address. 
So his build is op tables the PC because the PC will also build op tables because then what will happen is the server will respond now. Okay, because somewhere I've got to identify a logical address. So bear with me for a second here. So he'll respond to that traffic, all right? Um, so there's another type of broadcast address. So let's say he magically knew, this PC over here magically knew that he had to talk to C. So he sends out the data. All right, so let's quickly wipe this very quickly. I'm going to take my switch back to its normal spot again. Okay, and let's say he wanted to send the traffic. Give me one second, guys and girls and everybody in between. Okay. So I just want to wipe this out a little bit. Just be with it. Otherwise, I have to drill everything again. It takes too much time. Okay, so we're saying he wanted to go from A1 to C. Okay, C1. Brilliant. So he fires the packet out again. The packet gets to logic. So let's create this as a blue packet. The packet fires, gets to logic. Logic says, okay, wait a moment. I want to first learn something from you. I've just learned that on port 1 equals A1. Okay, and then he says, but okay, where do you want to go to destination port? C1. Okay, let's check my table. It is empty. I've got ports 2, 3, and 4, but this is empty. It equals zero information. Okay, so in that case, what do we have to do? Okay, what we have to do is we have to fire it everywhere because I can't predict where C1 would be. Okay, he then fires the packet out of that and this and this port. And a packet gets to him and gets to him and gets to him. Now this guy says, wait a moment. He resolved this packet to layer 2 and he says, this is for C1. I am A2 and he drops the packet. This guy gets the packet and says, wait a moment. This is for C1 and he drops the packet. So where's the benefit so far? Well, the benefit is right here. Server gets it and says, yeah, this is for me. And he replies with a packet. Okay, and this time it is from server to PC1. His source port is C1, his destination port is A1, and he fires the packet off. Packet hits this device, let's change color this time, let's go into a red. Okay, hits the switch, switch takes to logic. Logic looks at this and says, okay, what have I learned? I've just learned that C1 lives on port 4. So this equals C1. Do I know the destination port? A1. Oh yeah, I've got something for that. And fires the port packet only out of this port. Never there and there. So I've just saved bandwidth. And that's effectively what a switch does. It's got broadcast traffic and unicast traffic. I've just shown you that if it's broadcast traffic, it goes everywhere. If it's a unicast traffic, it literally sends between these two devices. Okay, I want to address one more thing on switching because I'm going to talk about switching more in detail going forward. All right, of course, with VLANs and all those good stuff and spanning tree and so forth. But for now, I just want you to see the difference between a hub and a switch. Because if we go a couple of slides back, all right, and you look at a hub, it has no logic effectively. And that's what we've said before, all right? It's just a piece of copper, which means if there's broadcast traffic, versus unicast traffic, versus multicast traffic, it makes no difference because there's no ways he can learn addressing. He will literally take all, every single packet he receives and send it out of every single piece of copper that he has connected to it. Okay, and that's a hub versus a switch. Okay, in my next lesson, what I wanna talk about is full duplex versus half duplex. Um, you might be thinking to yourself, you must be joking. How can we still talk about half duplex? Well. Wi-Fi networks today are all half duplex. Okay, let's talk about that. Not as a bad thing, but as an understanding of how things work and congestion. All right, and then I'll show you how they evolved this switch into a full duplex device. All right, and how that pretty much enhanced the switching infrastructure. But for now, all I want you to, to take away from this is that you have three different types of traffic, broadcast, unicast, and multicast. More importantly, multicast, uh, I'll move into a later stage is also categorized as, as a type of broadcast traffic, right? But I also want you to realize at the moment that there is a very different big, uh, difference between a switch and a hub. 
a hub literally cannot identify between the different types of traffic and sense everywhere. A switch has enough logic to figure out, wait a moment, uh, I need to learn some information. So there's logic involved, right? And because I know something, I can start to predict traffic patterns and traffic flows, right? And I can start to direct traffic across my logical plane. And then, like I said, can think, okay? And that's why initially this was a very expensive box, right? Because it could do something more than the previous device that just extended copper. This guy actually thinks about packets. So for the first time ever now, they moved into looking at a packet, right? And what it should look like. Now you can imagine at that point, um, they must have started thinking about, okay, how do we always connect? What type of connections? And if the connections are so, then what type of packets? Because uh, you wanted to start creating a standard and that's pretty much moving it up in the Aussie model. So from an Aussie model point of view, where does the switch live? Data link layer, which is layer two. All right. And for the first time ever, think about it, it takes more processing than in layer one because layer one is just copper. You don't make a decision, you just move it up. All right. Um, and that's also a great place for a switch to start seeing if there's a broken packet. So that's where we actually start doing the cyclical redundancy check. It's a great place for a switch to check the validity of a packet, whether it's a real packet and it could drop packets early on. So if this guy was sending a broken packet, somewhere in line there was a bad line here, right? And a packet arrives in the switch, the logic could sit there of the switch and say, wait a moment, this is already a broken packet. Why forward a broken packet? On a hub, it's bits. Man, bits arrive, bits leave, right? There's no ways of forming a packet and checking it. So at this point, the switch could actually verify the packet, make sure that all the bits got there and fire it off. Okay, so you can see what we basically started doing. So that's why we have it in the data link layer. Okay, in my next video, video form, I wanna talk about full duplex. Now let's move into a, a next slide here. Okay, I'm gonna talk about a half duplex versus full duplex, because this also was something that was really exciting. that started evolving at that point, right? And basically how that works together. And I wanna show you how people break switched infrastructures with hubs right by moving a hub into a switched infrastructure and what the, the the consequences of that is right and i want to start just mentioning something like a broadcast storm okay i always say to you guys if things work well because what happened was they put a hell of a bunch of a lot of switches together because suddenly they could just break out this network man and they started daisy chaining these things right and all together and suddenly things started happening they started getting broadcast storms. They started getting spanning tree issues. I'll show you all of that. So we're going to talk a little bit about spanning tree protocol. Just mention it. We're going to talk about VLANs. I'm just going to introduce the concepts. I definitely will do an entire video on VLAN and an entire video on spanning tree protocol. But I'll just introduce them in the next video to you. And I want to really focus on the half duplex versus the full duplex concept. Okay. I uh, just want to thank you for your time. I hope you found this a little helpful. Um, and I hope you can get some value out of this. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Bye-bye.